Great. Okay. Uh, terrific. Well, well, thank you all for being here. Uh, we, we appreciate it. I know at the, the end days of the semester and things are winding down. So we are just really grateful for you to taking the time or maybe you're welcome for this break from grading. I can't decide how I feel about it. Um, <laughs> But, uh, and uh, I wanna start by thanking my co-editor, Steve Raphael, who's an economist at UC Berkeley, who unfortunately can't be here. He is celebrating his daughter's college graduation somewhere in the country, um, as well as to our colleagues at the Russell Sage Foundation, especially Suzanne Nichols and Sheldon Danziger, who were obviously the, the instrumental in making this issue happen. Um, this issue, which I will show, thanks Matt, um, is really a collection of team endeavors. Um, and we are so happy to include the papers that we'll hear about today, um, but equally lucky to have papers on unemployment and unemployment insurance by Alex Bell and colleagues, and a paper on the same topic by Alexandra Ravenel and her colleague Savannah Noble, papers on gender and parenting, including work by Liana Landover and colleagues, and by Marcia Yabara and Francia Lua, work on housing, some of which we'll hear about today, um, and as well as a paper by Vincent Reyna and Yan Wali, and a pair of papers on criminal punishment and COVID-19 by Samantha Plummer and colleagues and a paper by Heather Harris. Um, while we can't feature all these articles today, I really encourage you to check out the journal. It's open access online and you know, the, the goal is to have it widely read. Um, finally, we're really grateful to the Stone Program here at the Kennedy School for hosting this event and especially to Matt uh, for organizing and coordinating everything and making it also easy. Um, so I'm going to start just with a few introductory remarks, but I won't take long, and then I'll pass things along to Diane. Um, the first COVID-19 case was diagnosed in the United States in January of 2020, and earlier this month, we saw the end of the COVID-19 emergency. The three and a half years in between were an extraordinary moment in global history. In the United States, the pandemic resulted in excess mortality and morbidity, as well as in an unprecedented decline in employment and periodic lockdowns of economic activity across the United States in an effort to stem the spread of the virus. These events spurred extraordinary action by the United States government. Recent work, including high profiles reports, document the likely causes of COVID-19, as well as the government's public health response, Operation Warp Speed, and you know, many other sort of amazing endeavors that we're familiar with. But the nature of the COVID-19 pandemic and the non-pharmaceutical interventions deployed to counter it also had dramatic consequences for the economic well-being and health of American households and for inequality. We saw, as to take you on a, a tour of horrors, um, a, a widespread school closures that we have seen really set students back with measurable learning loss across communities in the United States, but particularly concentrated in communities of color and lower income communities. We also saw the rise and perhaps durability of remote work, which provided many white collar workers with real flexibility but also combined with school closures in particular, really preci precipitated substantial gender inequality. As Landover and colleagues show in this issue, remote learning led to reductions in mother's employment, especially among less educated parents. We also saw, even as white collar workers uh, were able to work from home in many cases, the continued presence of frontline workers. And in some sense, as these workers continued to staff the front lines, they did so in jobs that were already precarious, but now faced with conditions that really made these jobs in some sense existentially dangerous. The risk of on the job transmission and a lack of access to meaningful paid sick leave for many of these workers and meaningful access to at home testing and other kinds of non-pharmaceutical strategies. In some sense, one legacy of COVID was to widen even further the gulf in the experience of job quality between these frontline hourly workers and white collar professionals. As we'll hear about today, the pandemic and the sharp shocks to economic activity presented an enormous threat to the economic security of American households. At the same time that large swaths of the professional class transitioned to remote work, and as frontline workers continued to go to work, uh, millions of Americans were thrown into unemployment. Both the disease itself and the economic fallout reinscribed racial inequalities, falling most heavily on Hispanic and African Americans. For instance, in the issue, Samantha Plummer and her colleagues document the sort of excruciating difficulties faced by a group of court-involved New Yorkers, men in Rikers Island at the time of the COVID-19 outbreak during this first phase of COVID. But the government response, as we'll hear about today, was unprecedented. Stimulus payments, expanded UI, improved access to safety net programs, eviction moratorium, child tax credits. These had a real measurable difference, which, which again, we'll hear about, but in one other article that we are not able to feature today, Reina and Lee find that emergency rental assistance not only reduced arrears for renters in Philadelphia, but significantly improved their psychological well-being. 
these programs really worked. And the pandemic presented an unprecedented test of what large scale social, social safety net support could do for American families. But while in some ways the work we'll hear about today documents the extraordinary success of the response while it lasted, it's important to recognize the response did not reach all Americans. It collided with incredible political polarization, a racial reckoning, and deep anti-immigrant rhetoric and anti-immigrant action. We see this vividly in the qualitative work by Waters and Calvo that we'll hear about today, um, as well as by work by Yabara and Lua in the same issue. We see this in the racial inequalities and the recipiency of needed unemployment insurance in the work of Alex Bell and colleagues also in the issue. And finally, as we all know too well, these generous programs were rolled back. What this issue can do in looking back is to ask what lessons can we learn about the effectiveness of public policy and of how to sustain effective safety net policies. I, I can't help but also notice since we're here that there was an extraordinary academic response to the COVID-19 outbreak. And for me, it was always in really clear relief to the Great Recession work, where there was also spurred a great deal of academic research, but on a completely different time scale and of a completely different scale. It seemed that the, while the Great Recession was years in the processing and waiting for large scale standard data sets to come online and be able to be analyzed, COVID was instantaneous and sort of at a global scale. Every academic immediately began working on COVID. And so we had this incredible real time outpouring of data sort of reinterpretation of events. And so this volume does not purport to be the first assessment of the consequences of COVID-19 for socioeconomic inequality, but it does present an opportunity to step back and consider these consequences broadly for work and employment, for poverty in the safety net, for housing, for the criminal justice system, and especially for inequalities by race, ethnicity, gender, and nativity. And so I'm delighted to host the authors of these three wonderful papers today, and I will pass it on to Diane for the first presentation. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Thank you. So I'm, of course, giving a very abbreviated version, uh, but really happy to answer any other questions. This is joint work with Hillary Hoynes and Marion Bittler. Uh, so, of course, you remember uh, COVID. Uh, there was a huge economic spike. Lots of people lost their jobs. Um, job loss was even more concentrated among Black and Hispanic populations. Our first um, graph in the paper is about that, but I, that one hit the cutting room floor. And instead, I want to start uh, talk about um, the unprecedented fiscal response to this. And so what I have here is from monthly treasury statement data, uh, which is new monthly spending. So, take, you know, we have food stamps in times good and bad, and so we're going to net that out and just talk about the new money that's uh, been flowing in because new money is, uh, you know, what helps provide fiscal stimulus, et cetera. Um, so what you can see here, um, it's um, over a, essentially a two plus year uh, period. Um, the green bars are those economic impact payments uh, that you may recall. Uh, they came out in three se sections, um, April, 2020 was $1,200 per adult, $500 per child. Um, passed in December, but paid out in January was an additional 600. Can I stand up or Please. is that gonna, yes. okay, no, good. No, I just good. can't, I can't talk no, and sit possible. at the same time. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, the other professors understand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, then, and then the big one in March. So I think the first thing I want you to take away from this is overwhelmingly how much of the money was in that green bucket, those economic impact payments. Those were the least targeted, either toward the poor or to people who experienced economic destruction. All right, economic shock. Now, later on, I'm gonna uh, show you some impacts on um, poverty. And to do that, we need the micro data from the um, current population survey. And so we're only gonna be able to talk about that first year of payments. Um, and the second year of payments, I can talk a little bit more about, about later. Um, the next is the blue here. That's the unemployment insurance. You remember, we talked a lot about that, right? Where we added an extra $600 per week at the beginning, extended duration, patched some holes in the safety net. And you can see, you know, this was you know, substantial dollars. And, you know, it ebbed and flowed um, over time. But still, in terms of, uh, you know, dollars spent, uh, it's just much smaller than those um, untargeted economic impact payments. SNAP here is in orange. And even though we more than doubled the amount of money spent out during with SNAP, uh, and it's the most targeted of, of the relief, at least targeted toward the poor. Of course, UI is targeted toward people who experience the economic shock. 
Um, it's a relatively small amount of, of money. And then finally, this uh, refundable tax credit uh, that was paid uh, for six months um, in the second half of 2021, which in the end reduced the child poverty rate to 5%, the lowest we've ever seen on record, and uh, did tons of good. I, uh, and I miss. Um, this is what that looks like in terms of cumulative spending. Over here, I have an inflation adjusted cumulative spending for the Great Recession. Now, before Karen comes after me, I'm going to say that um, much of the fiscal response um, in the Great Recession was through the tax system by reducing so that's not picked up here, but you can see just the difference in um, magnitude of response. Uh, and the, the colors are, of course, the same because I'm not a monster. Um, so you can tell, uh, you know, what's what's what. Stimulus was very small, um, UI, um, and so uh, what we ask in this question is, how did the safety net respond, and how did that differ by race and ethnicity, and uh, also particularly how did it um, differ for children? So I'm going to mostly talk about the general social safety net response. Um, it's a variety of programs. Uh, we're limited to talking about the calendar year 2020, so that first year of COVID. And something that is uh, important to note to everyone in this room and online is there is substantial known measurement error in the current population survey. So we think that this is uh, you know, <laughs> biased and understated probably. And so we don't leave it at that. We also uh, look at administrative data from SNAP. That's all hit the cutting room floor for this presentation, but I assure you, I would love to talk to you in great detail about <laughs> SNAP's response. Uh, to this. So let me talk about um, poverty um, impacts. Um, so just to start, to set the context, this is all people and then for children, uh, you know, weighted by children, not just households with children. And you can see uh, that overall, uh, the poverty rate was about 12%. Uh, it is lower for whites and higher for blacks, um, with a ratio a little bit more than two to one uh, that is relatively persistent over time and also present in food insecurity. But blacks are, in good times and bad, have about twice the rate, uh, two to three times the rate of both poverty and food insecurity, mm -hmm. Asians and then Hispanics. So this is where we were starting. You know, it was a good point of the you know, economic cycle. Um, and then uh, what normally happens when there's not a big fiscal response is poverty goes up during recessions. But this time, because we spent so much on fiscal relief, uh, poverty declined. Now, of course, I want to be clear that uh, there's two ways to measure poverty. One ignores the social safety net and one includes it. And so we're using the one that includes it, which is the only sensible thing to do, uh, uh, but is worth, is worth stating for the record. So what I show you here is across uh, the racial and ethnic groups and overall, for all people and for children, what happened uh, to poverty and the orange is the decline relative to the previous year. And so what you can see here, I'm gonna come over um, and talk about children, is there are large declines overall and disproportionate declines among uh, Blacks and Hispanics, at least in terms of percentage points. Of course, percentage impacts because you um, uh, divide it by the, uh, the base, it's actually a pretty similar um, percentage, uh, percentage impact. Mm -hmm. So the supplemental poverty uh, declined um, in 2020. So we can look at our very complicated social safety net and understand what did what um, in response to this. And I want to start by saying, you know, this is overall, this is for children. Um, the largest um, reduction in poverty came from that first year of economic impact payments. That is not the second year where it was even larger. Um, and then um, the normal earned income tax credit, this was not when we had the expanded child tax credit. And this is a pretty standard finding that EITC and the uh, traditional child tax credit um, is usually the, uh, the biggest actor in terms of reduce, uh, lose, uh, moving children out of poverty. You can see unemployment insurance and then SNAP both reduced in this, uh, you know, we know that it's understated because of the uh, data errors and it's just what we can do at least in this time frame. Uh, but these are large um, protective impacts against poverty. 
And then I wanna show you what it looks like across the big four programs um, by race. Um, and I hope you will appreciate that I lovingly added very large numbers to these for you all uh, <laughs> yesterday. Uh, so what you can see across the top, so this is um, you know, for children, white, black, and Hispanic. Across the top are those um, economic impact stimulus payments. Again, just in the first year, you know, reduced uh, Hispanic children in poverty by seven percentage points. It was huge. Um, uh, the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit, you know, similarly had a larger impact on Black and Hispanic uh, children. For both of these, um, I won't lie, we were surprised to see such large impact. Generally, we like we think that more targeted relief will have a larger impact uh, and a bigger bang for the buck, which has not changed during this time period, uh, but a larger impact on Black and Hispanic families. But in this case, we find that those uh, universal payments, because their magnitudes were substantial, mm -hmm. lifted more kids out of poverty. Um, unemployment insurance, you can see um, you know, reduced by two to three percentage points. And then um, the increases in SNAP payments that were done uh, reduced Black child poverty by three and a half percent, Hispanic by two percent. Um, I will note that uh, the Hispanic number, I think, is lower because um, because during the recent years prior to the COVID recession, many, many um, immigrants fell off of SNAP because of, uh, because of the public charge rule yeah. and, and other related issues. Uh, now I um, know that the story continues and we don't yet have the microdata analyzed on this, but you know what happened next, right? We saw an even larger decline in poverty because of the continued fiscal response. Um, from 2020 to 2021, we expect to see uh, you know, the same pattern of results, but the impacts are going to be larger um, relative to baseline for Blacks and for Hispanics. So I've skipped over a lot of things, uh, but I've spent you know, essentially the last two years studying this and this alone, so excited to um, talk more, but here are the sort of the big takeaways. That, that economic shock was large and it was disparate. It was worse for Blacks and Hispanics. So too was the safety net response. It was large, it just less targeted. Um, SNAP um, was a large spending increase, but it was a small share of that total fiscal outlay. And then the rest of the safety net response, it really, I think the big takeaway was those stimulus payments, the economic impact payments, drove a lot of the anti-poverty impact. Um, and so we conclude that the universal dollars had a very strong protective impact for Blacks and for Hispanics. Um, and this is important. Um, poverty is bad for children. It's bad for our economic growth. Uh, it's bad for children's development. And you know, what we can see is one of the things we've learned during COVID is that it's a policy choice. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a policy choice that we're making. Um, and you know, to be sure, um, I maybe would have spent the money differently and we need to do more postmortems to understand the strengths and weaknesses of this approach but there were lots of strengths. Thank so, you. Thank you. So um, we will do something similar. Uh, it's a brief uh, overview of our paper, of our research, but then we are very happy to discuss whatever questions you have. So we were uh, working. Uh, we were already working in the in the field, interested on older immigrants, on the intersection of immigration and and aging. When the pandemic hit, we were interested in understanding how immigrants navigate uh, social services, what they encounter, how do they find about where to go, how they are treated by providers of services, and how all this impact on their sense of, uh, on their incorporation to the United States and their sense of uh, belonging. We were doing this work with a joint team of uh, graduate students from social work and, and social work. Uh, why uh, all their uh, Hispanics immigrants? Because is the, most of the research on immigrant incorporation has been conducted with children and with um, uh, working age, uh, the traditional working age adults. 
yet um, older uh, Hispanics are the fastest growing segment of the older population in the United States. It's yet a hidden population. We know very little about this population uh, and they reach uh, older age with more functional limitations than any other group, given the jobs that they have and the career they have in the United States, yet with the fewest assets. Hispanics, older Hispanic immigrants are the group in the United States that needs more support at older age because they live longer than any other group, even non-Hispanic whites. And their only assets or income, if they have it, is mostly social security, and you can imagine the amounts. So we, so long story short, we know very little about these groups of immigrants. And what we know is that they live longer with fewer assets, and we know basically nothing about how they manage. We assume that they are taken care by their family members, but that's what it is, an assumption. So we wanted to study this. We conducted uh, in-depth interviews before the pandemic. This was in person, but we had like, what, 20 in person? <laughs> and then the pandemic hit. And we had to do everything over the phone. <laughs> Not even Zoom. Zoom what? No, phone. <laughs> phone. And uh, so we started data collection. So the pandemic hit, we had to stop, then resume. And, and we have to thank our graduate students and the Hispanic community. They really came for us because uh, you will see that uh, most of our, um, and our graduate students uh, that are bilingual and, and they when they mobilize the whole community. To get this sample, we mobilize everyone. And because you see that uh, we had people from all these countries. We wanted to do another thing we wanted to do is if we are gonna get to this, we are going to steer away from the panethnic Hispanic or Latinx or whatever you wanna call it. We really wanted to understand different groups with their histories of immigration. And something very important that is also under the radar most immigrants that are Hispanic working age are migrating late age because of family reunification. Most people we are getting are 50 and over since 2008, since the recession. And that's also something that we know very little about. So you see that we have people from, from Cuba, Dominican Republic, El Salvador, Mexico, Puerto Rico, and Venezuela. But half of our population are either undocumented or with liminal status and almost half are also late migrants. People that, for instance, Venezuelans, all of them that we have, have been in the US for less than five years. And then uh, with um, Mexico and El Salvador, we have, uh, is where most of our undocumented uh, population concentrate, also with the Venezuelan, with their liminal status. And, uh, but we wanted to have the most diverse group possible. That's why we did this sampling that was very expansive because we didn't, the, the typical snowball didn't work for us. Because if you go to a day program, you know other people that has the mass health that gets you into that day program. But we also want to reach those immigrants that don't access benefits. Mm -hmm. And those are usually at home. So that's why we get uh, this diverse sample because of uh, how the, uh, the community help us. I'm gonna say a quick word about uh, comparing Massachusetts and Florida. Mary and I, uh, these are two case studies, as you know, with two very uh, uh, extreme approaches to social policy particularly for immigrants. And we wanted to, given that we are interested in how people navigate social services, context is very important. That's why we focus in, two, in these two uh, states. My friend. Okay. So uh, uh, we um, uh, found a number of things after uh, uh, talking to um, both, we talked to both um, immigrants and uh, some social service providers. We yeah. about 20 interviews with social service providers. Mm -hmm. um, first was that there are many misconceptions uh, that providers have and that uh, many Americans have about the elderly. 
Uh, most of the people that we interviewed, even at very advanced stages, were working. Um, and they were present in the workforce or they were unemployed because of the pandemic. Um, and so uh, this was a big factor for them. There's great heterogeneity across all of these different legal statuses and uh, sending countries. Um, legal status was of course incredibly important, but there is a spillover effect in that even legal immigrants were very strongly affected by the, um, the targeted anti-immigrant nature of the, some of the supports that Diane just talked about mm -hmm. that were specifically designed for the Trump administration in a very cruel way to not go, not only to undocumented people who didn't have a social security number, but to go, not to go to anyone in that household mm -hmm. who uh, didn't have a social security number. So citizen children, citizen spouses could not get the aid. Um, in addition, the public charge rule, I'll talk to you about that, had a very chilling effect on people who were legal, but were afraid to, um, to access benefits. Um, uh, there was a lot of linguistic and social isolation, and this was an interesting factor that came into our comparison between Florida and Massachusetts. We designed it because Florida is stingy and Massachusetts is, is um, uh, more, um, uh, generous, uh, but uh, Florida also has a very established uh, Spanish speaking population. And so in some ways, uh, and they also have a large elderly population. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, the, the policies in Florida for elderly Spanish speaking people were better than mm -hmm. in Massachusetts because of the Spanish language media and the outreach to elderly people. So that was really uh, an mm -hmm. unexpected finding. And I'll tell you about some of the coping strategies that people used. Um, uh, these, are, I'm not going to be able to read all of the quotes, but um, this is Pedro, a 70 year old Salvadoran in Boston, um, working as a janitor uh, with a disabled wife who he has to hand feed, um, who has a mother in El Salvador, a 70 year old with a mother in El Salvador that he is supporting. Um, and uh, he, um, is trying to get a job because he's laid off as a janitor. He has nothing. Um, he's not getting any benefits. And he's trying to both continue to help his, uh, his parent in El Salvador and um, uh, uh, feed his wife um, and uh, uh, find more work. Um, uh, Rita was a Venezuelan asylum seeker who arrived in Miami three years ago also. Um, uh, I think she's in her 60s or 70s. Um, uh, she uh, gets to work at 7 a.m. She cleans, she takes care of the children. Um, and uh, the woman that she worked for, and we saw a lot of this, um, yeah. of the exploitation of people who remained in the workforce. The woman um, was going to uh, um, uh, cut what she was giving her or give her less because she was eating during the day. Um, and this is a woman who is a mechanical engineer in Venezuela, um, and uh, she is coping with um, uh, this loss of, of social status and uh, trying to continue into the um, uh, workforce. Uh, so the public charge rule uh, is um, uh, a rule that, that the Trump administration put forward that in fact did not um, <coughs> Uh, make it past the courts, uh, but it was designed to say that it, it, we've always tried to restrict immigrants based on um, whether or not they would become a public charge. And what they tried to do was to broaden the definition of a public charge that if you got any benefits from the government, you could be barred from becoming a citizen or getting a green card. And uh, the news about this spread very rapidly in the immigrant community and made people afraid to get things that they were, um, they were entitled to. Uh, so here's a 70 year old uh, Dominican who says, I'm worried that it will affect me for my children. There's a woman that I know, uh, they went to her house, put her down as disabled, she gets money. She asked for her children before me, but she has not heard anything. Um, so to sponsor her children to come. Uh, I think the government believed that she's going to use the money to help her children when they get here. 
um, I can't ask for help because it will affect my children. And we heard many, many stories of this. Um, here's somebody who got, he has a green card, he got the stimulus check. We are thinking of asking the government not to send us the money. We can't cash it because we don't know how we are going to return it. Um, and uh, uh, there were many examples of people who should have gotten these checks and did not. Um, people also avoided health care when they had um, uh, COVID because um, uh, of not being able to afford it, but also because of the, the incredible fear people had based on uh, the Trump administration ice raids. Um, and so he said, uh, uh, jo Josefa says that she's not gonna go to the hospital because they put your information in a little sheet of paper. What if ice gets it and comes from me? Um, so how did people deal with things because they didn't have the support that other Americans did? One was that families doubled up. Uh, sometimes the elderly who were legal and who were getting social security or SSI were the only people with any income. So people doubled up and uh, the elderly supported many generations living in their household. Um, so uh, they're talking about rationing what they eat, rationing um, uh, health care. Um, so many were continuing the money back home, uh, which uh, I think many of our national surveys don't uh, uh, capture this, but this is a very, very important thing for immigrants. Um, and uh, uh, food pantries became more important in um, both Florida and Massachusetts mm -hmm. for immigrants who were not getting SNAP or who were not getting other, other benefits. And some food pantries uh, require that you give a name and an address because they are uh, coming from local um, uh, funds and some just give money. And so immigrants told each other where they, uh, not give money, I'm sorry, just give food. So immigrants told each other where to go to, to find the, the food uh, banks that would not take your name because they were terrified of, of taking them. So um, they were not aware of rent assistance. Uh, they had to choose between essentials, food and medicine. Um, and uh, the, what really strikes me listening to Diane's talk and then looking at the data that we gathered is that yes, um, government and policy really can improve things for people. And it also can be unbelievably cruel in how it restricts who is going to get it and um, beyond who is targeted by, by the government. I think that was one of the most important findings that we had was how it spread out uh, to people, even to households that um, were not at risk, but who were terrified because of the way that the Trump administration had targeted immigrants. So thank you very much. Um. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for having me here today. Thanks for the invite, Danny. Uh, I'm delighted to share this work, which looks at eviction filing patterns across the United States over the, for the course of the first two years of the pandemic. Um, and this is going to be a somewhat more positive story. Uh, you know, this is a story about a crisis that was averted by and large. Um, and I think it's important to take stock of, and just to get our bearings on what, what did happen, what worked, um, and also to think critically about what we what we haven't yet focused enough on and where we need more answers and better understanding. Uh, I wanna acknowledge upfront that this is a, a big collaborative effort with a lot of very talented co-authors, all of whom are either currently or formerly affiliate uh, of the eviction lab at Princeton University. Um, so I wanna start with some of the numbers that Diane didn't present upfront. Um, these are weekly unemployment claims um, from uh, 2006 through the middle of 2020. So over there on the left, you've got the Great Recession looking kind of quaint. Um, and, and then you hit the COVID lockdowns and suddenly in the course of 10 weeks, 40 million people file first time unemployment claims. And what do we know about the people who are filing those unemployment claims, right? They were uh, disproportionately likely to be working in the service sector, in retail, like Diane alluded to, they're likely to be black and Hispanic. Um, these are people who are more likely to be amongst the one third of Americans who rent their homes than they are to be homeowners. Um, and what we also know about renters is that they don't have a lot of a personal safety net, right? Mm -hmm. The typical renter in this country has little or nothing in the way of savings, nothing to see them through in the case of a sudden financial calamity or a job loss on this scale. Um, 
And the reality is that rent, the landlords can and they will file to evict you as soon as you are behind on rent. They're, they're not going to wait and let you catch, catch up. Um, and so this raises the specter that suddenly millions of households are at risk of facing eviction cases, ending up doubled up um, with friends and relatives, facing the risk of homelessness. Uh, you know, these are exactly the circumstances that you want to avoid if you're trying to stem the spread of COVID-19. It's, it's much harder to socially distance if you're living with your, you know, your aunt and her family. Um, so in the face of this budding crisis, policymakers stepped up in a lot of ways. Um, and that took a number of forms. So first of all, we did something that we've never done in this country before. We implemented a, an eviction moratorium at the federal level. And we did it twice in 2020. First as part of the CARES Act, uh, which was in late March of 2020. And then by order of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in September of 2020. And that, that CDC eviction moratorium was in place for nearly a full year until it was struck down by the Supreme Court. Um, 43 states, the District of Columbia and five US territories also established their own eviction moratorium. Um, these policies varied considerably from place to place. Some were relatively weak. Um, the shortest was in place for only seven days, I believe. Um, but some of them were quite restrictive and a number of them were in place for more than a full year. Um, the federal government also stepped up with emergency rental assistance. Um, through the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021 and the American Rescue Plan, Congress made more than $46 billion in emergency rental assistance available to, to landlords and to renters who had fallen behind. Um, again, not something that we have done before, uh, certainly not on that scale. A number of states also contributed their own funds here. And then a number of the policies that, that Diane was talking about, the, you know, those stimulus payments, uh, expanded unemployment insurance, the child tax credit, this is putting a lot of money into people's pockets to keep rent paid, right? These, are, these sort of income supports really help. Um, so the kind of broad question that we're looking at here is, what, what was the net result of those policies? What did that do to eviction filing patterns um, over the course of these, these early years of the pandemic? And we're looking specifically here at, from the start of the pandemic, which we date to, to March 15th, 2020, through the end of 2021. Um, and to, to, to get at that question, we're using data uh, on eviction court filings from 31 cities across the US. Um, I want to just emphasize here, this is a purposive sample of cities in which these data were available before the pandemic and during the pandemic. So it's a, a, it's a pretty wide array of cities. We've got five of the 10 largest in the United States, but we also have smaller places like um, Greenville, South Carolina. Um, we have places where it saw a lot of eviction filings before the pandemic. There's also places like Boston where eviction filing rates were relatively low before the pandemic. Um, but I just want to emphasize, this is a non-random, non-representative sample overall. Um, and using those data, we get we, we ask and try to answer four questions. So first, how did these policies affect eviction filings overall? Were these effects equivalent across the cities in our sample? Which renters tended to benefit the most from these policies? And then finally, fourth, specifically, what effect did the, the moratoria, the state and local eviction moratoria have in reducing these numbers? So um, starting from that first question, um, this is changes in eviction filings over the course of the, the first two years of the pandemic. This is a breakdown of monthly eviction filings relative to historical average for every month from January 2020 through December of 2021. And what you can see is that over here on the left hand side, eviction filings right before the pandemic hits are right about at normal levels. You're 100 percent of, of average. That's that's normal. And they start to drop in March of 2020, and they bottom out in April 2020 at below 10% of historical average. Start to creep up over the next few months. CDC moratorium goes in effect in September, right here. And for the next year, while it's in place, these filings are at, or you know, most months below 50% of historical average. Uh, they start to creep up after the Supreme Court strikes down the CDC moratorium. And if you were to extend this time series over to here, which is like the current day, you would you would find that that number is now back to 100%. So we've, we've gotten back to where we were before the pandemic. But over this period, from March 15th, 2020, through the end of 2021, overall, we recorded the filing of 600,000 eviction cases in these 31 cities. Under normal circumstances, we would expect to see 1.4 million. 
So that's 800,000 fewer eviction cases being filed than under normal circumstances. It's a reduction of 57.6%. This, this is a big reduction overall. Um, but it doesn't look the same everywhere. And that was our second question. What, is, what sort of variation do we see from place to place? Um, and this is gonna be, so this is cumulative eviction filings from the start of the pandemic through the end of 2021 in each of the 31 cities that are in our sample. Um, and so you're going from 15% of historical average in Austin, Texas, all the way to 78% of historical average in Las Vegas. And generally the story here is that the cities on the left-hand side of this plot are the places that put in place stronger protections and that kept those protections in place for longer. Whereas the places on the right, weaker protections for shorter periods of time. But it's not a perfect heuristic. There's a lot of variation that just like the policies as written can't really explain. I want to highlight one case here. Um, so this is Charleston, South Carolina here on the left and Columbus, Ohio here on the right. Neither of those cities had an eviction moratorium, like any eviction moratorium in place after June 1st of 2020. But eviction filings overall were reduced by two thirds in Charleston and only one third in Columbus. So different practices by the landlords, different practices by the courts are really affecting how many of these cases end up getting handled and how many people are facing this threat. Um, the third thing we wanted to look at was who, who tended to benefit from these policies. Um, and one way of looking at that is to think about the neighborhoods that normally see the most eviction cases and those that see the fewest eviction cases. So we've divided the, the, the neighborhoods in these 31 cities into quintiles based on their eviction filing rate before the pandemic. So we've got the, the neighborhoods that are relatively or low eviction neighborhoods over here in quintile one and the high eviction neighborhoods in quintile five. And here I'm just showing how many fewer eviction cases than normal were recorded in, in neighborhoods in each of those quintiles. So what we found is that the vast majority of, of benefits were recorded in the neighborhoods that see the most eviction cases under normal circumstances. They saw the largest proportional reductions and just given the denominators in these spaces, the effect size was huge. It's 475,000 fewer eviction cases in quintile five. If you combine the other four quintiles, it's 325,000. So you've got a, a really heavy effect on the, in the neighborhoods that are normally seeing the most cases. You can also look at this by neighborhood racial composition. Um, so here categorizing neighborhoods by as majority black, majority Latino, majority white, or neighborhoods that have no racial majority or, or some other racial majority. And here I'm showing eviction filing rates, typical eviction filing rates before the pandemic, which is in blue, and then during the pandemic in orange. And across the board, you're seeing steep reductions in eviction filing rates, in, you know, regardless of racial composition. The proportional reduction is largest in majority black neighborhoods. That's a 56% reduction in majority black neighborhoods. Um, you go from a, a typical eviction filing rate of 12% before the pandemic down to 5.3% during the pandemic, which is like a very steep reduction. I think it's worth pointing out here, though, that I'm sorry, I got to stand up too. I, it's the same problem. Um, <laughs> even during the pandemic, we dropped this by 56%. They're still seeing higher eviction filing rates than a typical white neighborhood before the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. This hasn't closed these sorts of gaps. Um, so, the fourth question that I wanted to get at here uh, is, so what, what effect did the eviction moratoria, the state and local moratoria in particular have? And one of the problems that I think all of us who are studying policies implemented during the pandemic are facing, so we did a lot of things all at once, right? Mm -hmm. And disentangling the causal effect of any one of those policies is really challenging. We're able to leverage the, the staggered rollout and repeal of these state and local measures to try to get a, a beat on exactly what effect they had. Um, and it's important to understand here, like the stages of the eviction process. So normally the eviction process plays out in five stages. First, your landlord tells you that they intend to file a, a case against you. Second, they actually file a case with the court, which is what we're gathering data on. Third stage, the court holds a hearing. Fourth, if they, the judge rules against you, there's an, an eviction judgment that's issued. And then finally, fifth, an eviction is actually executed. So we want to distinguish, we, we, we want to look at the effects of policies that are the most restrictive. Um, so we're looking at strong eviction moratoria that stop one of those first three stages. The understanding that those are going to offer the most protection to tenants. 
What we found is that one, one of those policies, one of those strong eviction moratoria went into effect, we found a, a you know, relative to historical average, a 21.3 percentage point decrease in eviction filings. Um, it's important to understand that this is while all of the other pandemic era things are happening in the early months of the, the pandemic. Um, and our control group here includes cities that were implementing at least weak eviction moratoria. So we're not comparing to a baseline in which nothing is happening. This is an additive effect in addition to everything else that was going on. And when these are rolled back, we see eviction filing rates really increase dramatically. So we see this increase of 43 percentage points relative to historical average in the four weeks after these policies are rolled back. And that's a persistent effect for the weeks that follow. Um, so overall, uh, just in terms of kind of general takeaways here, we saw an, an, you know, an enormous reduction in eviction filings over the first two years of the pandemic. You know, there's almost a 60% reduction in caseloads overall. And this was concentrated in neighborhoods that normally are seeing the most eviction cases and that are the hardest hit by the eviction crisis in this country. Um, with that being said, there are a lot of inequalities that remained. Like there, there are large variations between cities in how well protected people were. If you were a renter who was struggling to pay rent, you were much better off if you were in Austin, Texas or Minneapolis than if you were in Las Vegas or Columbus, Ohio. Um, and there are these really strong, persistent racial and income disparities that did not go away during the pandemic. Um, I think we've got evidence here that the eviction moratoria worked and that they had clear effects. Um, there's not a lot of policy, there's not a lot of appetite for reimposing eviction moratoria, right? Um, which is why I think it's really important, like I think Raina and, and Lee's contribution to this volume in, is so helpful in understanding what emergency rental assistance did. I think there's a lot more work to be done on that front. And I think we also need to think more about how the child tax credit protected families. Because we know that a lot of the families who are facing the threat of eviction have kids and are the would be the recipients of these sorts of programs. Anyways, uh, I'm really looking forward to the Q&A. Um, well, I think maybe I'll start us off with a question and I'll direct it broadly and then you can think on your questions and then we'll have plenty of time to get them all asked. Um, so rather than, you know, getting the weeds on any one paper, I, I guess one thing I wanted to get all of your thoughts on, and, and it's probably most prominent in, in Rocio and Mary in your paper, is, is the role of trust, trust in, in government in all of this. On the one hand, you sort of talked about the role of distrust, but also perhaps evidence that when government takes effective action, that can increase trust. And so I wonder either in your own work or in how you might imagine conducting future work, if you could speak to this role of, you know, header, you know, the role of trust in, in government or distrust and heterogeneity in that process. Maybe we'll start with Rocio Mary since it's so at the foreground of your work. I'll give it a stab. Of, you know, what we didn't present is that, you know, we do have people who are citizens who have been in the U.S. a long time, who got the government help and who were better off from it, right? So there's incredible heterogeneity among um, uh, the people that we talk to, but the chilling effect of not having trust in the government when you most need the government and when the government is actually trying to help, uh, it is really, I think, deep in our, in our data. Um, did you want to? I, I agree. Do you see a lot of variations, for instance, from Cubans mm -hmm. that came and, and their experience with government that came, you know, many decades ago. And, but at the same time, this woman that we feature here uh, got naturalized with IRCA. So it's still, she had a good experience, you know, the only amnesty that has happened in the history of the United States. Yet, this was Josefa. This was the same woman that said, my husband, is a permanent resident and I don't want to ask for anything because that may jeopardize his chances to get citizenship. And I have a bunch of kids that, uh, you know, are in a nominal status and my grandkids. So even having this good experience, that distrust was so, they didn't have enough to eat. She had diabetes 
and could not afford the medication. So food insecurity, only doing the diet, yet experience the, 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 the Reagan amnesty. Yeah. So it, it didn't buffer enough. Yeah. So, so we've, um, I've been working uh, on, a, on a, a related project with um, Danya Keen and a, a team out of pub the public health school at, at Yale, where we've been doing interviews with renters who are at risk of eviction um, uh, to try to understand their experience how did they understand these policies? And how did they understand their obligations to pay rent? And like, how much trust did they actually have in the system? And what we keep hearing from them is that this was a lifeline and that the additional funds were enormously helpful. This bought them time, but they didn't trust it. And they, mm -hmm. they, were, they, were, they didn't trust the landlords wouldn't find a way around these protections. And they didn't trust that the system was actually set up to benefit them, especially for black renters. There was this, you know, persistent distrust in, in the willingness of the, of the court system to work to their benefit. Uh, I think I want to answer the question more about our political polarization, mm -hmm. which is closely related to that. And, you know, just frankly, given how polarized we are and were, I can't believe that we made such a big fiscal response, mm -hmm. uh, which I think was. You know, I would have maybe designed a few things differently. I would like to have some better infrastructure to to target some things, but it was a really extraordinary response that did a lot of good. And I worry that you know the next time something bad happens, we won't be able to rise to occasion like we did this time. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Well, let me let me turn it to the room, and I'll, I'll call the questions. Yeah, please start us in the back. Uh, you showed the table showing the um, et ethnical distribution, white versus <clears throat> black and Latino. So I am just curious, uh, did you look at the stratified data? How many uh, white people is the tenant or the property ownership? And how many black people was tenant? So it needs to be uh, adjusted data and what's the percentile it's really race related or they are less number of tenants and in the market so they are going to eviction um this is the first comment uh, first not uh, notice i want to say and then second thing um what kind of eviction you look at this uh, is it no fault evictions is it non-payment evictions? What kind of evictions they are? And I just observe if it is uh, non-payment uh, eviction and during the moratorium, if it is frozen or uh, the numbers get reduced. And my comment is why government continue to pay those people to prevent evictions much longer or forever? So the reason is if it is non-payment, the government should involve and help those people really need it. Thank you. Sure. So the first one's a good demography question. Yeah, or a, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 still a demographer. <laughs> yes, I should. Uh, um, so just first of all, we are looking at, at residential eviction cases. We don't distinguish by cause. Um, so the vast majority of evictions are brought for non-payment of rent. Um, that remained true during the pandemic as it was before the pandemic. Um, the figures that I showed were by um, neighborhood racial or ethnic majority. Uh, in the article, uh, we also do some work using um, statistical imputation to try to understand the likely race uh, or ethnicity and the gender of the defendants on those eviction cases as well, which lets us look at, at the potential for uh, disproportionate filings against members of certain racial and ethnic groups. And what we have found in research prior to the pandemic and during the pandemic is that black renters in particular face disproportionate risk of eviction, often about twice the rates faced by their white counterparts. Um, we can't fully distinguish all of the causal factors in it that lead to that. Um, and uh, you asked about the, the characteristics of the, the landlords as well. That's much harder to, to distinguish, especially because 
in many of those cases, you know, the person who is listed as the plaintiff um, might be a, a property manager, uh, mm -hmm. might be an LLC that owns mm -hmm. the building. Uh, it's just, it's much more opaque who it is that's actually bringing those cases. Let's, let's make sure we get some other questions out. We can come back if there's time. Yeah. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah, here in front, please. Thanks. This is really, really interesting and like exciting, but also a little depressing. Can I ask like three questions, one to each? Great. Okay, great. Cool. Okay. So I think my first question was, um, were you able to look at the um, effects of the continuous coverage requirement for Medicaid um, enrollees on poverty? Um, no. And is that like not? It's just kind of like out of out of uh, my okay like expertise. Okay. I'm sure some people are working on okay. that. I should know um, that was like too challenging to like measure. Or it was just not. It's just not not my lane. Not okay. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> um, I was wondering on the in the interviews that you all did. I noticed that you said it started. They started on December 2019, and then sort of went through the pandemic. How many? It was like 178 interviews total. But were you able to look at any? differences between the people who you spoke to before these policies started to roll out compared to those who maybe received them first and, and then like later in the pandemic? Does that make sense? Do you want to you wanna ask your third question? Okay, yes, no sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, so yeah. my last question is like on the trust piece of this, and I guess this applies to like all the policies, that's something I'm really interested in too is like people are saying the government is working for them or maybe not. But like, I'm wondering if you all have thoughts on like now that these policies are being rolled back or taken away, sort of any, like the policy feedbacks of that, um, because these are policy choices. Uh, uh, we had uh, before, we started right after Thanksgiving 2019, so Christmas is not the best time to gather any qualitative data. So it was mostly January, February, and March, and most of our respondents uh, we didn't have any data from Florida yet. It was concentrated in Massachusetts, those three first months. And we didn't have a uh, very um, diverse sample. Most were people that um, from Massachusetts, we didn't have at that point any undocumented immigrant or any, or any asylum seeker. So in that group, what we saw was um, the same needs of sending money home, home to their families, being in the job market. They were already there in that sample. What happened then when we could resume uh, with data collection that was in June, what we saw was the impact of COVID on that. So people that were working suddenly were unemployed. People that could send money couldn't, the double up. So what we saw was the impact of COVID in a situation that prior COVID was already um, precarious. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. That is the word. So what we saw is, yeah. So I'll add um, it sort of response to kind of all of your questions. Uh, now that some of these pandemic relief payments are being sunset, especially uh, just a few months ago, um, the extra payments in SNAP uh, mm -hmm. got eliminated, but some states had eliminated them earlier. And so that sets up a nice difference in difference. And so we've been able to do some causal work mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. And um, what one thing that is important to remember is that resources are more or less fungible, right? And so one thing we find is when the SNAP benefits decline, people fall behind on their rent more. Uh, so I would love for you all to talk more about SNAP, um, or at least once on SNAP um, in, your, in your work. You know, we find that uh, food insecurity goes back up. Uh, what we don't find is that people change their employment status, right? So they, um, and so uh, we do know, I think, increasingly more, especially about the turn off. The turn on, everything happened at the same time, and it was a big hot mess. Yeah. But because this is stretched out for so long, I think I'm optimistic that we'll learn uh, learn many things. To the, to the question about um, kind of trust and the erosion of trust as these programs get sunsetted,
I think that's right now that's that at least partly get at that question with with renters, but also just you know having talked to some of the people who are in, in social service provision and so like the the people who were administering programs, these emergency rental assistance programs. We've been working in this field before this, mm -hmm. and suddenly there was this you know the spigot of money got turned on in a way that we'd always said wasn't possible, right? Mm -hmm. And suddenly there were billions of dollars to pay people's rent, to help them stay in our homes. And, you know, it worked. And <laughs> this is not terribly surprising, but um, but then when you turn off the spigot, that's also like, that's dispiriting. And that's, you know, that's that's a hard thing for them to deal with. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we'll see the, the the effects of that for years to come. I'll just add one thing on behalf of some folks who aren't here. And that, that's in a paper by Alexander Ravenel and colleague. They do in-depth interviews with uh, unemployed gig and, and, and precariously employed W-2 workers in New York. And one thing they find is that folks really, you know, the, the stimulus funds made a big difference, unemployment funds made a big difference, but people really were uncertain about how long that was going to last and how long the COVID pandemic was going to last. And so often they reported saving it. It was supposed to be, you know, mm. stimulus also, right? Like economic stimulus. Mm. And they didn't want to do that. And they often felt bad when they spent any of it beyond what they absolutely need it. And that is the sort of uncertainty meets, it is a distrust in government, no, but it's it's real uncertainty around where mm -hmm. this thing was headed that fundamentally changes the nature of the government's response and its consequences. As an economist, I just need to uh, insert that um, if we can't turn off the emergency funding when the emergency is over, then in the future, we won't be able to turn it back on. Yeah. And so that is important to remember. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great, let's go to David. Thanks, um, really fascinating. And I guess my question picks up on what Danny just said. Um, I was astounded by your comparison, Diane, of the spending in the Great Recession. I, mean, I had no idea the magnitudes were so vastly different. So we're talking about the effects of turning off these things, but I'm really interested in all three areas about the presence of lasting impacts. I mean, for instance, I've thought, and people have said this for a while, but your, your, your figures show this dramatically, partial explanation of the great resignation period and, this, and the fact that people were slow in coming back and were shifting jobs a lot could be a, a second effect of the massive spending. I mean, the story that you tell in a, it also has this lag of the Trump period on the take up of public benefits in the latter period, which is a lagged effect. And I'm curious about sustaining effects into the present period. And even in a world where we're not going to get moratoriums again, I'd be interested, are there any lagged effects? Again, given the very dramatic effects you showed in people's attitudes towards rent, in, in, in the structure of rental markets generally coming out of this experience where the, the effects were so large? So I think my best answer to that great question is, I don't think we fully, or we even partially understand the great resignation and what, why things uh, rebounded so slowly. People have tried to do while well identified, you know, studies of different pieces, everything you know, explains a little tiny bit, but the bulk of it, uh, you know, my friends who are economists at the Fed say, look, we've studied and studied, they have spent the money, we just don't understand. And so I, you know, I, while I think it is easy to say, oh, we overspent and so people are hanging out on their couches, that doesn't seem, I think reality is much more complicated than that. And in the fullness of time, maybe we'll be able to, you know, disentangle it. But right now, I just don't think we know. So yes, I think that um, the effect of the Trump um, uh, attacks on immigrants very much had uh, an effect into the Biden years. And I think it's still having an effect on people um, access, accessing services. I think the understanding of what the public charge, will, it never went into effect, right? But the understanding of what it was uh, and the deep fear around it. And of course there are still um, raids and, and people still are at risk uh, just because Biden's president, our immigration policy continues to be awful. Um, so I, I think that there is still this um, 
this, I, I don't think that Biden has been able to reverse the fear that Trump instilled, um, even though objectively things aren't better, although they're still bad. Mm -hmm. So thinking about kind of long-term changes to um, to the eviction process and this sort of this form of housing instability, you know, there were a number of changes that I, I didn't talk about as part of this presentation that were, I think, spurred by greater public awareness of and policymaker focus on 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 eviction during the course of the pandemic. So you know, it was there were three right to counsel programs in the United States before the pandemic. This is providing lawyers to people who are facing eviction cases. Um, we now have this in the full state of Maryland, full state of Connecticut, full state of Washington. Uh, it's rolled out in, I think it's we're up to 17 cities now um, that have these programs. Um, you know, those, that's a, a lasting change that, that shifts the dynamics of landlord tenant power in those places. Uh, eviction diversion programs have gained a lot of ground. Places like Philadelphia has made a major investment in eviction diversion. Um, at the same time, there are, you know, pr primarily red states where they have reacted negatively to the ways that local officials tried to prevent eviction cases from moving forward. And so moves towards state preemption that would prevent localities from enacting additional protections in the case of a natural disaster or another public health emergency. Um, and where I think that's driving toward is a, an increasing bifurcation of th that was already there in America beforehand, which is just that it's, it's much better to be a renter in some places than in others. And you're gonna be much better protected in, in certain markets than you are in others. And that's, I think the gap is just growing between those places. Great, let's go to here. Christina? Okay. Oh, oh, over here. Back, uh, other way Just around. Just impatiently. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Keep being patient. It's okay. Um, thank you all so much for this work. It's really exciting to hear how it's come together and so important too. I'm really interested in potential trade offs that I'm noticing across the three in kind of the trust necessity access and how that might differ across different population groups. Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, but it looked like in your last chart on poverty reduction that there actually wasn't poverty reduction in older Americans. Yeah, oh, in the in the 20, uh, 20 to 2021. Yeah. Right. And pairing that with what I was hearing from Rocio and Mary's study about especially kind of the uh, most needy older adults perhaps not want to take up uh, supports that were there just trying to triangulate across these stories and wondering about, you know, at what point does necessity to eat or whatever kind of overtake the fact that you don't trust the payments and you're just going to take them. Um, and I'm sure this has implications, Peter, too, for, for eviction. Although I, you know, that that's kind of the, the root here in, in comparing that result, Diane, against the qual work. Um, and just any, any thoughts or, or, or insights you might have into some of those trade-offs as we see comparing these kinds of data sources in different social spheres. I can speak directly to the uh, question of the elderly. Uh, the first year of the pandemic relief, their um, poverty went down by more, as I recall, than other groups. And then it just stayed flat in the second year. And it, that second year was when they, we had the expanded child tax credit. Um, there were no more real changes to SNAP. I mean, it's so basically they were experiencing something pretty steady. And so I think that's not entirely surprising, you know, that, that, that there was there was no change. But maybe the broader point of that is, you know, we have this, you know, safety net that is, you know, a patchwork of many different uh, policies. And depending on which levers you pull, different people will be impacted. And we need to understand that and, um, you know, then, I guess, deploy our responses accordingly. Our respondents, you are absolutely right in the observation that they didn't trust um, the government and they didn't want to go either for the stimulus check or the, they had other resources, which we could not uh, talk here in depth, 
but we have a whole section of resources that they had. For instance, they went for uh, food, food to food pantries that they didn't ask for education, but then they were very creative. For instance, all their adults that were living in congregated housing, they did potlucks all the time in the neighborhood, in, in their buildings. So they trade foods. Uh, they, uh, those that live in, uh, in families that develop and they were, they had kids, for instance, many schools gave free lunch and breakfast and you just had to go with your car and put it in the trunk. And so they, we have a whole, we have so much data and we have a lot on strategies because that's another thing that Mary and I want to kind of debunk the myth that these older adults are just there waiting <laughs> they are, and this happened with immigrants in general. Immigrants are very resilient and very creative and throw them something and more, and they're going to respond. And we had a lot of data on that and we want to focus on that. So although you are right, that shows in, in, in the data, they had uh, all these strategies that allow them to, to, to get those needs avoiding the the government and and may has this wonderful uh, doctoral student that uh, in the school of social work we are all in love with <laughs> that <laughs> studies um, system avoidance mm -hmm. and so we are focusing a lot about that analysis to, to also highlight the the strengths and the resilience and all that the immigrants bring. Great. Uh, I think you just passed the mic right down the row here. Hi, uh, I'm really interested in um, something like the graph that you showed about uh, geographic variation in eviction rates, and I guess just geographic variation in, say, the implementation of some of these policies. Um, uh, like, who are the play? Who do you think is, are the players driving some of that variation? Is it more so at the state level, like red versus blue, like what you're saying? Um, and I guess, uh, yeah, just more broadly about uh, both geographic variation and the take up of some of these policies and then also the extent to which they were implemented? Yeah, um, that's a, it's a good question. So we um, we have a paper in housing policy debate, um, Emily Benford is the lead author on that, that really describes what these state and local policies look like. Um, and one of the things we look at is, is who implemented them, right? Uh, in some cases, it was the courts proactively saying, we're shutting down, we're not, we're not hearing more cases. Governors, in some cases, and in a lot of cases, legislatures also then followed through. Um, they offered different reasons for why they were doing this. In some, you know, for economic reasons. In some, very clearly for public health uh, reasons. And then they varied as well in, in sort of what form they took. There's definitely a there is a strong red blue element to it, um, but it's not a perfect predictor by any means. Uh, and there are, there are certainly exceptions to that rule. Um, so yeah, I would urge you to check that one out. It'll go in depth. I have a question while, while you gather your thoughts. Yeah. Oh, please. Uh, yeah, uh, so that something that we were able to test with SNAP is, um, how, you know, so caseloads went up very quickly and we could relate that to what was the take up rate conditional on eligibility prior to this. Um, because there were sort of two competing hypotheses. One was, oh, places that already had high participation rates, conditional on eligibility, might be better run, you know, better outreach, better all this sort of stuff. Or on the other hand, if they had low, maybe there's more room to grow. And what we set, found was very clearly the former. It was the places that seemed to be better run, they have higher take up always, that saw the bigger gains. And so we think that that gave us some insight into Know, the role of administrative burdens and you know um, how well you're running your social services. Can you do that as well with the UI update? UI is such no. a <laughs> We will say that I'm Alex injured. Bell and yeah. colleagues in their chapter do take a look at recipiency rates and how they, you know, how that varies across place and they find, you know. Right, but that's a California, right? But they also look across, they have some cross-state data as well. Okay, it's, um, the data are less good at, at this moment in time with the UI, unfortunately. Um, let's go here in front. So I feel like you've given us a really vivid picture of how you two of how policy works and you of how like threatening people with policy works, <laughs> right? Yeah. 
What do you think the lessons are that policymakers have taken from this experiment? And I realize that there's a huge variation, you know, across the political spectrum, but I'd be interested to know, I mean, obviously there's one dimension, which is, well, it caused a lot of inflation, but <laughs> um, I'm interested to know in each of your areas of specialty, what lessons you think have been learned at the, at the federal policy or, or state and local policy making levels. So I, I guess I, I think there's a good, a good lesson and a bad lesson. The good lesson is that uh, we can reduce poverty with policies. Uh, something that came out of the pandemic that I was really excited about was a permanent authorization of summer meals, uh, uh, summer uh, money for meals, um, uh, pandemic EBT programs. Um, that's gonna do a ton of good. And that was something that was really stress tested during the COVID pandemic. On the other hand, I think that um, it will, you know, we really need to dig in and better understand you know, to what extent did um, the long duration of the continued payments slow down the, um, you know, the, the labor market improvements? I think that the postmortems will show that that is small, but I think um, many, many uh, policymakers right now are taking away that we overdid it. I would, I'll, I'll borrow the same frame, the good lesson, the yeah. bad lesson here. And I think the, the, the very positive lesson here is that you can, we can reduce eviction rates in this country. Like under normal circumstances, 3.6 million eviction cases are filed in the US every year. And that doesn't have to be the case. And like when we reduce these numbers by almost 60%, we didn't hear about hundreds of thousands of landlords going out of business. Like uh, foreclosure rates didn't suddenly spike. Um, this was not, this did not precipitate a, a crisis for landlords. Um, I think the, the more troubling lesson here is, well, there's you know a certain amount of blowback that policymakers faced for having made the process slower and they, they listen to landlords and they hear that feedback. Um, and there's also a story that I think is not supported by any real empirical evidence at this point that things like eviction moratoria and emergency rental assistance contributed to rent growth and the, like, the, the sharp increases in asking rents that we've seen over the course of the last couple of years. And I don't, I, at this point, we just don't have an evidence to, to support that. But, you know, if people can learn the wrong lesson, they sometimes do. Um, I, I think that the, um, the whole story of how um, the Trump administration used whatever levers they could to, to really target immigrants and probably other groups that I'm not as, as uh, well aware of, um, uh, is a study basically in how to um, uh, use policy levers to, to, um, to reach your, your goals. And in a way, they were way, they were so creative in the ways in which they uh, slowed down the processing of immigrants and the ways in which they, you know, returned documents that had a black mark in a corner of it and, and then, you know, put people uh, unable to reapply to get a green card, et cetera. So, you know, I think the public charge rule was a, a way of using fear, but the, you know, the, the crafting of the policy so that no one in the household could have a taxpayer ID instead of a social security card was a way of targeting, um, uh, targeting those who are in blended families and were legal residents who lived with undocumented people. So um, I, I think the Biden administration, from what I can understand about what's happening in the immigration uh, uh, bureaucracy right now, is trying to use those levers to um, reverse the reverse course. And, and uh, I don't think they're being as effective. I think actually that the, the Trump administration was incredibly effective at, at doing what they set out to do. Great. Um, we also have a, a large online audience, and I know there are some questions there. So maybe, Matt, if you would intermediate, and, and that would be great. Yep. Uh, one person in the online audience who is a student at HKS asks a question for Professor Diane whitmore Shanzebach. Uh, could you talk more about the, quote, bang for the buck, end quote, of universal programs versus targeted programs? 
What do you think the poverty reduction for children by program would look like if SNAP was a larger share of the stimulus? Yeah, great question. And I think uh, certainly more study is needed. Um, I would be quick to say that, you know, it's not that money is wasted when it goes to children above the poverty line that are all also low in, right? Um, and in fact, indeed, some of my recent work with Hillary Hoynes shows that, you know, we are spending more and more of our social safety net dollars on the near poor. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't want to just, you know, laser focus in on the poverty rate because I think that's that's too narrow. You know, now that said, um, we spent a lot of money in that green bucket for the economic impact payments. And I'm not sure, you know, that we got, um, much bang for the buck on that. Although, you know, I think, again, you know, further study is needed. So, you know, if more came from SNAP, uh, I think we would have seen, you know, larger poverty reduction in that group, or especially for Blacks and Hispanics. Um, I mean, let's pick up on that. More study needed on universality and the trade-off, but yeah. as you, you know, don't complete this work, but having published these papers into a room full of students, masters, doctoral students, pre-docs, like what do you see as, a, as, a, as an important pressing question for research that people might take up coming out of the work you've done? Uh, so for me, so much of it is about, um, I guess, connections across different aspects of one's life. Um, I've just been serving on a National Academy panel where we're trying to understand the impacts of uh, federal policies on health outcomes. And you could drive a truck through um, the holes in the literature, just first order things that we don't understand. Um, you, so I, you know, similar, you know, the thing that I pushed Peter on that, you know, increasing SNAP benefits means that people can pay their rent more. Like there's a lot of interconnectedness yeah, that we don't understand and that we should understand. I mean, I think it's very much the same with eviction, where we're just starting to like scratch the surface of what we understand here. Um, and you know, even just questions about the, the the risk factors of who's who's at greatest risk and what what effects this has on people's lives, especially the lives of children who are living in these households, um, who are at, you know, at disproportionate risk of being filed against for eviction. And I think that that yeah, the relationships between things like SNAP and uh, the child tax credit and eviction risk are enormously important for policy debates moving forward. I would say that uh, two things that are really important uh, to understand going forward. Um, one builds on this issue of the interconnectedness and the complexity of our safety net and really comes out in, in our research on administrative burdens and the ways in which people have to strategize and have to, I mean, it's so complex, right, to, to think about how you get aid when you need it. It is not straightforward. And so, and then if you combine kind of more private aid and the public aid, it is just really complex. So I, I think looking at the administrative burdens and looking at this interconnection and yet, and how people understand it and access it is really important. And then secondly, I'd go back to your first question, Danny, which I, I think for all social scientists, the decline in trust in the US uh, is I think both a cause and a consequence of our polarization and really uh, is endangering a lot of what we treasure in our society. And I, I think more people should be working on that and trying to understand that. Terrific. All right. Well, with that, let me thank you so much for being here. Thank all of you for coming. Um,